Well, it's that uh, point in our service where we're going to be opening the Bible. And, uh, you know, we're a church that believes in and loves to worship God. And uh, we believe in praying for one another and asking God's spirit to come upon us. And we also love to open up the scriptures and ask Jesus to teach us uh, and to shape our lives. You know, new babies, they're just growing machines, aren't they? Over the course of that first year, that cute eating, puking, crying, dare I say pooing, um, bundle of joy can double in size and maybe even triple in weight. They have, uh, newborn babies have just that capacity to grow and the speed of growth is extraordinary. You know, if they continued that trajectory of growth by the age of 11, we would have 450 pound 11 year olds that are nine feet tall. Just extraordinary uh, growth. Obviously, that doesn't happen. You know, when we come to Jesus, there is spiritual rebirth, isn't there? Um, there isn't a cap. He doesn't limit our spiritual growth. Often we do. Um, and in this season of all these crazy uncertainties, it seems like there's a stirring, an inner yearning to know and to be, be more like Jesus at the moment, to know him and to be more like him. Uh, if you're anything like me, I'm just very aware of my own inadequacies and there is a fresh hunger to be more like Jesus than ever. A couple of years ago, actually five years ago, we planted some plum trees in our garden. And to be brutally honest, not a lot of fruit. Um, and then I noticed that there was like this thorny bush that had somehow taken root around uh, the base of these little trees. So I dug it up, I ripped it out. That was a year ago, this year we had more fruit. Isn't that interesting? Healthy plants produce. Healthy plants reproduce. There's something inevitable that happens when a plant is healthy. And there's something inevitable about when we are healthy, when we're healthy disciples, we disciple. Healthy followers create more followers. Our lives, the followers' lives become the very net where others are caught up in and come to a personal encounter with Jesus and become committed followers or apprentices and disciples of Jesus. Healthy disciples disciple. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to be looking at some of the last words of Jesus. And if you were uh, 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 online at the national uh, conference uh, last week, you'll have heard Alexander Venter teach on this passage. And he was brilliant. I've got to be honest. Initially, I was like, wow, how on earth am I going to follow that? But, you know, at the same time, you know, I'm deeply encouraged. You know, I looked out this passage weeks ago thinking about discipleship and healthy growth. Alexander spoke on it now, you know, and uh, a couple of times. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm one of those guys, I'm a little bit slow at times. I need to hear something maybe from a number of different places and people before it sinks in. Maybe Jesus is actually trying to get our attention. And so if you've got a Bible, why don't you turn to uh, Matthew chapter 28. It's the first of the Gospels. It's right at the end. Um, Matthew 28 is known as the Great Commission. You know, Jesus is commissioning his friends to continue what he started. If you like, he passes a baton in this moment to his friends and says, what I've done, uh, I'm going to now, I'm asking you to do the same. He commissions them to live a life like him, a Jesus life. Why don't we read together Matthew 28, 19 and 20. 
He says this, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very ends of the age. Important last words. These would be ringing in the disciples' ears and hopefully embedding them into their hearts. But I also want to just read a little bit out of um, Acts chapter 1. This is um, Luke's account and probably uh, Peter's account of a very similar moment. In Acts chapter 1, it says this. It's, this is Jesus speaking. Uh, Do not leave Jerusalem. But wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You know, we hear what Matthew has heard and he's recorded that and then we are hearing what Luke's recorded and what maybe Peter has heard and when we overlay these two passages we've what we've got is we've got these instructions the command and the commission the something of the what uh, Jesus wants uh, the guys to do and the where but the key to doing it is in acts it's the who you know, Jesus doesn't ask them or us to do anything without him. We can't do the do without the who. <laughs> who is the who? The essential, personal presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And he's about to be poured into these guys' lives in a really uh, incredible, real way. And then the promise there. I will be with you to the very ends of the age. And that's great news, isn't it? Because that doesn't skip 2021 and a pandemic. Jesus is with us. He wants to empower us for us to reflect him. And especially at this time of uncertainty. He's commissioning them to live a life like Christ that attracts and pulls something of heaven in the, 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 the heaven future into our present reality, bringing perfect peace into strife, bringing healing of heads and hearts and bodies. That's what Jesus did. He pulled that future moment, that future time of our bodies being restored into the present. Or at least we need to make room for it. Unity and reconciliation where there's conflict, whether it's between two people or two nations. Heaven, being in heaven is being in the very presence of God. And so to live a life, is, I think, is that uh, a Jesus life is that we can experience God's presence with us today in a really real way. And I think it is an experience to see this world, or at least work towards this world's ecology being restored and justice and goodness breaking in where there's an abuse of power. And so Jesus is saying, and he's now sending his friends off to do the same things that he did in the manner in which he did it, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Being discipled and, and discipling is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's he who empowers us, he fills us, he's at work in us and through us that convinces and causes other people's hearts to be captured and captivated by him. It's like the Holy Spirit seeks to reach out through our lives and touch those around us. And so in some ways the pressure's off. We just need to surrender and ask him to fill us afresh it was the same for Jesus. This is how Jesus operated and it's the same for the disciples all those years ago and it's the same for us today. You know, um, you know it's significant, <coughs> excuse me, when all four Gospels record uh, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Here he is at the Jordan River. He comes to John the Baptist. And it says, as he come, you know, John the Baptist baptizes him, plunges him into the river. And as he brings him out of the water, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. All four Gospels record that moment because it's the model. Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do what he uh, was being asked to do by the Father. In Luke chapter 4, it says, And Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's had a private filling, if you like, for now a public life. And then he goes straight to the synagogue and reads Isaiah 61, which is this this incredible manifesto of liberation. Let me read it to you today. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me. There it is. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness the prisoners. And so what we have here is that for Jesus to fulfill the Father's instructions, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The disciples to fulfill Jesus's instructions, they needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's the same for us. We need, we must be filled. And I just believe for those of us who have just become Christians, of those of us who have been Christians for many, many years, this is never just a one moment moment. All the way through the Bible, it says that Christians were then filled and went on being filled with the Holy Spirit so that they would overspill um, him into the lives of others. 30 years ago, next month, I was in a little upper room, just like the disciples of a pastor's house, and some friends placed their hands on me. And do you know what? I surrendered to Jesus, and I was filled with the Holy Spirit and with real power. It was like Jesus had walked into the room. I felt I had physical, emotional experience. And some things changed immediately, and some things took some time. One of the things that did change was that I suddenly fell in love with scripture. I couldn't put this book down. I think in the space of a week and a bit, I read most of the New Testament. I experienced over and over again the loving power uh, of God embracing my life. I couldn't help weeping at times in in my bedroom as a 17 and a half year old lad. I was filled and I I, I was given the gift of tongues. Suddenly I was speaking in a different language and, and I was beginning to understand. I couldn't help share what had happened with my friends at school. And suddenly I had this overwhelming love for others. I wasn't perfect but I just could not help, couldn't contain what God was doing. The key then and the key now is having a fresh filling of the Spirit. And I am in a place where I am asking him to invade this skin, this space afresh again. And so discipling is a, is a work of the Spirit. But also it says here, discipling is for all and for now. When we look at Matthew 28, the original language isn't that easy to translate into English. It doesn't really say go and make disciples. It's much more as you go disciple or as you go discipling. There's an active assumption that we already have a go in our lives. Maybe just say to one another right now, you have a go. What Jesus is getting at is that we all have lives, routines, families. We've got connections where our lives intersect with and touch others. We've got colleagues and pals. The discipling field is here and now. That's where he's put us. Put us into families and friendships and working in environments to care for and to share Christ and to model something. And so I want to suggest this morning, God wants to fill us afresh for the field that's right in front of us. And when you think of, and this is for all of us, when Jesus gathered those 12 men and gave them that commission and those commands, yeah, he gave them those instructions. And then when we jump across to Acts, it's not just the 12 that have gathered waiting for the power of the spirit, but it records 120 people are filled you know, on the day of Pentecost. 
all their lives would have been affected. And it's clear then as we begin to read through the New Testament, some of the greatest moves of God came not just through those 12 men, but through other normal believers who had been filled with the Spirit. It records that it says that some who escaped the persecution in Jerusalem ended up in a city called Antioch. And guess what? It says that the hand of God, the presence and power of God was with them. And they shared Jesus with those people in that city. And it says that many believed and followed. This is for all because God loves all and he wants to use the all to reach all. In John chapter 4, Jesus is stood at a well and Chuck Freeland recently preached on this moment. Jesus said to his friends, look around you, the field, the fields are white for harvest. Let I'm asking the Lord, Lord, help me to look around and, and, and who's connected to me. Those that are Christians, I want to encourage. Those who are not, I want to encourage. Look around and see afresh, James. That's what I feel like the Lord is saying again to what those opportunities are, to where the kingdom will come and work through us in our homes, next door, in our families with people maybe we don't know well, but we see and, and our lives do intersect with. Maybe those intersections become the moments where the kingdom and the Holy Spirit wants to be at work. And we've got to start, I believe, in our own Jerusalems. And I appreciate that that can be a daunting task, but we need to be encouraged by the disciples' story. You know, many of them denied Jesus Jerusalem was the place of suffering and crucifixion. Their own back garden, their own backyard wasn't an easy place. And yet when the Holy Spirit came upon them, he gave them an unbelievable courage and grace. You know, when Peter and John were brought in front of the Sanhedrin, um, there's a moment where they just say to the powers that be that sentenced Jesus to death. They say, guys, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They couldn't deny what Jesus had done in their lives. They couldn't deny after they were filled with the Holy Spirit that, that there was something so beautiful and powerful had happened that they were like, we just cannot help telling others, sharing others with the others what God has done in our lives. It's amazing. Discipling is for all. And then thirdly, guys, we're going to land on this. Discipling is a process. Discipling is a multitude of moments that begin a make. You know what I mean? When we're making anything, it's a bunch of things that are going on. It's a whole series of movements, connections, uh, cognitive understanding, physical and emotional experiences. And Jesus explains that process by using two, two words. He say we are to disciple by doing two things. One, to baptize. This word baptizo, which means to plunge, immerse, submerge people and to teach. Didasco, to explain, to create understanding, to convey truth. And the Hebrew view, view of that was never a one-way lecture, kind of actually like what I'm doing right now, but much more of a two-way workshop where there's dialogue and questioning and, and bringing understanding. But we have two pieces of the same jigsaw, two words that describe, if you like, the how, to submerge and to comprehend, to experience something and also then begin to understand it. It's the marrying of being good news and speaking good news. We're called to baptize people who come to know Christ, don't we? You know, as we walk with them, we want people to come to a place of understanding and commitment. And so we, you know, in that moment, they were like, I want to follow Jesus. So we baptize them. We put them underwater. We plunge them into water. And it's a beautiful and precious moment. And I know that I've certainly missed it. And I know there's a bunch of people in our church that can't wait to get baptized, to literally take the plunge. But that public moment of declaration, if you like, it's a moment with a capital M. 
that comes on the back of a load of moments. The act of baptism is the culmination of the people of God immersing others in the life of Jesus. Water, the very water that we baptize people in represents the life of Christ, the love of Christ, the, and actually the sacrifice of Christ. And that should be pouring out of our lives, submerging the community around us, the people around us with compassion and care and love, when we're crying with those going through a tough time, when we're rejoicing with those where things are going well, when we're praying for people in the moment or when we're at home away from them. You know, it's like we're sharing our lives and his life. We're being family to those that don't have family. And they feel, they feel the effects of Christ in us. They're being submerged. And that's a generous, that, this is generous language. It's not a little bit, it's a lot. We want, and God wants to submerge people. He, he wants to be at work in us and spilling out of us into the lives of people around us, modeling something. And then he says to teach, to bring understanding, to model and to live out Jesus' teaching, to be able to convey who and what Jesus has done. And this isn't about somehow just regurgitating scripture, but it's the lifelong process of taking on board Jesus' teaching. I don't know about you, but I often wrestle not only with the bits that I find hard to understand in the Bible, but actually I wrestle with the bits I do understand, because I know I need to implement them into my life. That implementation is following. Jesus uh, says this, and, and we often quote this because we love the first part of this uh, particular quote. In Matthew 11, he says, Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. It's a sweet promise, isn't it? Come to me. We love those words. We often quote them, but we often leave it there, but we don't continue to read the next bit because the next bit explains how the rest comes, how peace comes. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And there's real irony in the illustration of what Jesus is saying, because yokes are not light things. You know, those big wooden um, structures that go across two oxen, that's, that sounds like an extra burden. But Jesus is saying the absolute reverse. He's saying, you're feeling heavily burdened, but take my teaching, let that touch your life, and it will actually alleviate the burden. My teaching, my ways, if you apply them, will actually bring about life and peace and joy and rest. And it will produce fruit. And that fruit produced in us will be picked by others. They will taste the goodness of it. I wonder if some of us are not at rest. And it's maybe because... There's some things that Jesus wants to lay on us and we need to take hold of afresh. And when we do that, his rest will come. His rest will reach through us to the people around us. You know, a person of peace stands out in chaos. A person of love stands out when there is hatred knocking around. A person of integrity stands out when there is gossip and speaks up. A person of kindness crosses the road when no one else does. A person of purity doesn't take what is not theirs. In finishing this message, we need to be saturated in you, Jesus, so we can saturate people around us. We need to take on board your teaching so we can model them to others. And so my prayer is fill us afresh so we can carry on, carry on 
take hold of the baton, what you have started, and pull something more of heaven in, into and onto earth through our lives. Healthy disciples disciple.